In the week that a world-leading forensic anthropologist declares that crime writers rarely get their facts right, we say that's nonsense. Welcome to episode 191 of the Desert Island Discs podcast. This is Partners in Crime with Adam Croft and Robert Dawes. Hello, happy Friday again, Bob. Well, happy Friday to you. Who said that? Who is this person that's criticising the whole well, rank and is, file um, of crime writing? This is one of the world's leading forensic anthropologists, actually. She, oh, um, right. She's a good friend of um, Val McDermott as well. Oh, right. Um, she was speaking at the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Her name is uh, Dame Sue Black. Oh, Dame Sue Black. Oh, yes. right. Well, fair enough. <laughs> she said it. She must be right. <laughs> she but, said that um, a lot of crime writers do get their facts wrong, but there are people like Val, of course, who, uh, who do their research thoroughly and uh, who want their crime fiction to be as realistic as possible. And this is right. something we've discussed on the podcast in the past, isn't it? Whether you go for realism or, or whether you go for story. I really need to stop headbutting my microphone as well. Well, well yes, whilst well, so we'll be getting a forensic anthropologist to actually sort, <laughs> sort out your remains. Um, <laughs> so, well, that, that's extraordinary. You know, we haven't in, in, interviewed um, uh, anyone for forensics on this show, and I think that's probably an oversight. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, well, if it's, it's a Sue Black, then uh, she really does know what she's talking mm. about, and, and she gives lectures uh, all around the country mm. Uh, mm. about it, I think, with Val too. So, well, she have, has a point there. must be sloppy. Uh, many people who are rather sloppy in that particular area. I don't know many writers who are. I have to say, most of the writers I talk to actually go to extraordinary lengths to try and get the facts absolutely right. Uh, time scales are something else with writers. I know that's a pressure they sometimes feel. Very often a criticism comes back uh, from a, a professional saying, well, that wouldn't happen, that result wouldn't get back within a week, so you couldn't expect it the next day or things like sometimes that. Sometimes it has to for the story. Yeah. Um, there are often ways around it. I mean, I've been speaking quite heavily in the last week or two with Graham Bartlett, who we yes. had on the show, who's um, an advisor to crime writers, former... He's um, the wonderful Mr Bartlett. Yeah, former a top gun um, in uh, the Sussex Police and Brighton. Brighton. And I've the book that I'm working on at the moment is um, needs to be, adhere to a certain timeline to make it work. Right. So I've been saying to him, look, these things need to happen. Um, this needs to have happened by 10:45. Um, by one o'clock in the afternoon, we need to be here. Um, how can we make that work credibly? And he has been absolutely brilliant. He's well, been, he uh, we've had so many emails going back and forth in the last week or two trying to hammer this out. But um, yeah, we have we we have done it well graham's extraordinary because he's you know he's given himself now to um passing on this uh, great wisdom to to writers um and uh, i know he travels around with his uh, to all the festivals with his uh, uh, compadres um uh, all with their own specific discipline talking about you know giving advice to writers and, and giving readers insights into real life uh, areas of, of crime and, and crime mm. detection uh, but he is, as he said on this show months ago, you know, he's absolutely loves working with writers and mm. and is very helpful, in fact I'm going to be contacting very soon, um, soon myself over a particular problem not mm. about doing something between 10.45 and 2.30 or whatever <laughs> it is, but um, probably not that far off Well I, I needed to make sure the police response um, happened at a certain time rather than um, but I won't go into it too far because I don't want to ruin the book. But as I am in the throes of writing another book, um, my reading this week has been um, this lofty tome in front of me. Um, Code D of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, 1984. What a page turner. It is. It's um, an absolute cracker. Um, it's It's got some... Yeah, some really interesting stuff. I won't ruin the plot twist at the end for you. I'll, who, um, I'll leave that to you. Who done it? Yeah, I won't, I won't tell you who done it, no. But, um, Cressida Digg stood in the library as Poirot entered. <laughs> it's uh, the Code of Practice for the Identification of Persons by Police Officers. So, oh. yeah, you, um, you, as you see, listeners, I do try to get it right. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm glad I'm sitting down because I, I find that incredibly impressive. <laughs> and are you genuinely finding it very helpful? Uh, I'm finding it very helpful. Or is yeah. it a bit like A level crime? Yeah, it is. It's a bit, it's a bit of a dry read, but um, it is it is helpful. All oh, right. Well, okay. Well, I can't match that for dryness. But um, my uh, um, uh, recommendation this week is a book by Sarah Vaughan. Uh, many of you may know of uh, Sarah's previous uh, novels, but. 
she's new to me, Anatomy of a Scandal is her latest book, and it combines Sarah Vaughan's experience as a news reporter and a political correspondent on The Guardian, with her time as a student reading English at Bracenose College in Oxford in the 90s. Um, that's quite interesting, actually, just going off on a uh, off piste, as it were. A lot of crime writers uh, tend to be uh, journalists, Mm. Of come from a background of journalists, um, of uh, and I wonder what that is. Is it, is it because obviously they're they're professional writers and they're yeah. storytellers and yeah, th- yeah. this is something they've always wanted to do, but also there's a gap. You see, a lot of journalists I know say the industry isn't what it used to be. <laughs> you know, you've got to find other things to do. It's probably one of the only professions in the country at the moment where you can genuinely earn more money writing crime fiction yeah yeah <laughs> there, aren't, there aren't many jobs that well that's well that. That, obviously i mean people like sarah, uh, sarah comes from a uh a journalistic background um sabine durant who i was talking about the other week yeah. uh, also anyway anatomy of a scandal by sarah vaughan is her third novel her first courtroom drama a psychological thriller and her first book for simon and schuster uh, she's married two children live just outside of cambridge another popular area for crime mm. writers to uh, to live i i notice as well um and is currently working on her fourth book um anatomy of a scandal it has been described as the good wife meets the affair well that's good enough for me <laughs> it centers on a high profile marriage that begins to unravel when the husband an mp is accused of a terrible crime sophie is sure her husband james is innocent and desperately hopes to protect her precious family from the lies which might ruin them kate is the barrister who will prosecute the case she is equally certain that james is guilty and determined he will pay for his crimes a high profile marriage thrust into the spotlight a wife determined to keep her family safe must face a prosecutor who believes justice has been a long time coming, a scandal that will rock Westminster and the women caught at the heart of it. Well, uh, well written, pacey and full of twists, says The Independent. Uh, a compulsive read and completely layered characters, John Boyne. Um, it's a page turning novel, re- reveals the precious nature of existence as the seemingly perfect lives of Sophie and her husband James unravel. The author anatomizes in gripping fashion the inner workings of the corridors of power as well as the hidden recesses of the the mind and heart. That's Anita Sethi, The Observer. Mm-hmm. And this last one from Marcel Burns in The Times. This clever plot raises many issues of the moment. Well, yes, political scandal, <laughs> political intrigue. You ruined my little segue I was going to do. Oh, <laughs> I was going to talk about political it... scandal being a, oh. a bit of a thing right now. Oh, did I ruin it? Yeah. Oh, there's a slight tear in his left eye, listeners. I'm sorry to <laughs> that's, have... That's um, because I've got my tight pants on today. I'm sorry to have rained on your parade. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> sorry, quite all right. I just caught up with your last statement. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, well, it's interesting. OK, so we've talked about this before. The umbrella that is crime uh, fiction. Um, obviously, you have the traditional crime, murder mysteries, the whodunits, the, the golden age, you have the, the, the serial uh, killers, you have the, you know, hundreds and hundreds of, of series with uh, inspectors, police procedurals. But also within that, you have the political crimes, mm. you have the political thriller, uh, which uh, I was talking to a screenwriter um, not long ago who was bemoaning the fact that it was becoming increasingly difficult to write anything uh, that didn't seem uh, less dramatic than actual politics as they exist on the world stage at the moment. This is particularly uh, about uh, America. I mean, there was a time when there were two presidents. Uh, one was Francis Underwood, as played, as played by the <laughs> disgraced Kevin Spacey. Uh, who was Machiavellian as murderer, I mean, just the most lethal sort of politician that you could imagine, but that was a drama. The other president was, of course, um, Obama, Barack Obama, who was uh, the saintly opposite uh, to the fictionalised president uh, in House of Cards. Of course, now uh, you don't have Underwood anymore, you don't have Kevin Spacey, who's, as we all know, is, is being, I think, prosecuted for all sorts of uh, things. Uh, uh, and uh, we now have another president in the White House who seems to be the polar opposite of uh, the increasingly saintly seeming uh, Obama. They seem to have merged both roles, don't they? Uh, yeah, brought fiction into reality. Well, yeah. Did Trump watch House of Cards? I don't know. I mean, obviously, I mean, unraveling in the week we are speaking now has been quite an extraordinary thing. 
The point I'm making rather laboriously, as usual, <laughs> is that uh, this uh, screenwriter was saying he'd been working on uh, a, a, a series which was set both in Washington and in London, uh, political uh, intrigue uh, and what have you, and uh, it didn't get made. Now, he's a very, very fine writer with a great track record. Uh, but he said uh, the criticism uh, from the powers of beer was that uh, it seemed too tame compared to what was actually happening on the world stage. Now, what does that say about the world we live in at the moment? Mm. Well, yeah, fact is stranger than fiction quite often. Um, but talking of um, facts and real-life crime, um, a bit of good news I saw this week is that uh, CBS Reality has... Um, Renewed two of its original true crime series for its autumn lineup, um, Evidence of Evil, which uh, first aired earlier this year, and of course, Written in Blood, which is presented yes. by a um, good friend of the show, Simon Toyne. That's going to be back for, for another series Fantastic. next year. Um, authors on the next series include Mason Cross, Sophie Hannah, and Peter Robinson. So um, Mason Cross, I love Mason Cross. Yeah, we've got yes. um, a great lineup of um, of writers there coming up next year. So that's all very good news, isn't it? Yes. Well. It is. And um, from the next couple of weeks, we're um, very much focusing on Scottish crime. We've got two Scottish crime authors in a row. We've uh, moved away from New Zealand, and we're, uh, we're now up in Bonnie, Scotland. Yes. and uh, Very far into Bonnie, Scotland. We are. Certainly are the first one, yes. So um, shall we, uh, shall we go with the first of those interviews? We'll go with this week's um, interview with Mr Stuart McBride. <laughs> Stuart McBride is one of the most successful Scottish crime writers in the past few years. He's been shortlisted for the Theakston's Old Peculiar Crime Novel of the Year Award twice. In 2007, he won the CWA Dagger in a Library, and in 2008, he was named Best Breakthrough Author at the 2008 Crime Thriller Awards. Uh, his Logan McRae books have entertained readers since 2005, and we're delighted he's joined us on the show today. Hello, Stuart. Hello. I have to say, though, you missed off the most important thing thing I have ever won. Go on. On your list. I was crowned World Stovies Champion in <sighs> 2014. I wasn't going to get on to that, but do tell us. Oh, yeah. How, us. how could we have missed out on that? Oh, you were oh, saving I, it and putting it Oh, that's wonderful. A Stovie. I haven't had a Stovie for years. They are the best. No, they, they, the they, best. they really are sensational. Hello, Stuart. It's Bob here. How are you? All right. <laughs> Hello, Bob. <laughs> do you want to let the uh, listeners know what a Stovie is? Because we do have listeners all over the world in um, that's Macedonia true. and uh, Trinidad, I think someone listened in from. So um, I'm, I'm not sure they have Stovies in Trinidad. I think they should do. They should Jerk, should. Sto jerk Stovies would work very well. <laughs> um, it's basically a, a dish in Scotland that will cause fist fights in um, <laughs> any pub because everybody makes it differently based on what their mum did. Hmm. So I have I have almost been punched uh, at Bloody Scotland Festival in Stirling because I was talking on stage about my World Stovies Championship and I make mine with lamb. And this woman, who was four sheets to the wind, was just right up. Right, right up in my grill, man. Just came, <laughs> if you're not making it with sausages, you're not making it properly. Those aren't stovies. <laughs> God. God. So she was fun. She was fun. So people do get quite um, passionate about their stovies. North of the border, you can start a war. Wow. South of the border, people go, what's a stovie? <laughs> can you have a corn stovie? Or is that really totally unacceptable on all fronts? You, you can have one, but then you <laughs> will be ostracised from polite society, yes. and quite rightly so. Right. <laughs> so be very careful who your stovey dealer is. And, oh, yes. uh, I think I think we had an idea, Stuart, that um, it's going to be quite entertaining talking to you when I looked on your website and uh, your biography was not the one that I just read out. It was one that went, uh, Stuart McBride was born in Dumbarton but ran away to join the circus at the age of nine where he specialised in wrestling bears for money, going on to represent Great Britain at the Atlanta Olympics. <laughs> in 1975, he won the Nobel Peace Prize for his revolutionary work on iron brew then went on to create the world's biggest ball of belly button lint. In 1989, he joined the Secret Intelligence Service, but was later invalided out due to a back injury sustained while performing a reverse overhead pile driver on a grizzly bear. <laughs> now confined to his pyjamas, Stuart fritters away his time writing crime novels set in Aberdeen and lying to journalists. <laughs> I, thought, I, thought that was, that? I thought that was it, real. It, it, <laughs> I'm just abusing I wondered at first. 
it, in these days of alternative facts, I, I think I can stand by my statements. <laughs> well, yeah, we have, we have to prove you wrong, I suppose, don't we? It's, uh, it's not on Snopes yet, anyway. Well, there you go. Uh, anyway, well, let's get on they to asked, they, they asked me to write my own introduction. Ah, that's always dangerous. They, 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 if you can't even be bothered to introduce me, fine, I will introduce myself. <laughs> and they published it, I believe. And they published it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they won't, they won't make that mistake twice, will they? Um, it means also I can cite it on Wikipedia as having a source. That's true. Of course. Because it was published. That's true. Must be true. Um, so, uh, yes, I think a lot of writers will uh, re- relate to the, the, the Jimmy Jam start to the day. Um, are, you, uh, are you a person who uh, 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 blutes and, uh, and blow dries his hair uh, <laughs> and uh, quaffs one's beard before sitting down at the desk to actually hit the QWERTY? Or do you, in actual fact, get out of bed, fall out of bed uh, in, uh, and sit by your uh, laptop or whatever uh, work unit you have and get stuck in straight away. I take it uh, that's your particular method of, of working. I, I sit outside for a couple of hours in my smoking jacket with a martini or two oh. talking to my cats. Oh, I can see it. <laughs> see, I mean, that's... I Sounds familiar like, to you, Bob, yeah, it? Well, that's exactly... I've got three smoking jackets, but no cats. <laughs> uh, I, know. I have one, one smoking jacket and four cats, so I don't know which one of us is winning. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, Stuart, your um, Logan McRae books are what we're here to talk about after um, having covered probably every other subject on the face of the planet so oh, There's far, plenty more on this list. Um, oh, also, also, do I wash? I know this was one of your first questions. <laughs> yes. How manky are you as a writer? We ask yeah, everyone yes. that. <laughs> well, yes, how manky are you? Uh, some of our mank writers uh, might have answers to that. But, uh, um, I, yeah. I Alexander McCall Smith going, one washes, yes, one does. <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's been talking? See, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not speaking to Alexander McCall Smith. We're we're having a we're having a feud apparently. Oh, oh. Yeah. is oh, this um is this a, a no. feud according to the newspapers or? I am. Um, I think it's the was it the Herald, uh. but um, he said something very unpleasant about Aberdeen at ah. um, the Bloody Scotland launch. Where if he's fed up writing about a character, he exiles them to Aberdeen, <laughs> where they can freeze in the miserable weather. And of course, I got contacted by the people. What, what do you think about this about Aberdeen? So I'm yeah. starting a Wickerman style feud. It's strange well, how newspapers do that. They, they did something similar to me a few years back. Apparently, I've got a long running spat with Sue Grafton, which I wasn't aware of. But, yeah. um, oh, they like they like a, a spat, and the longer mm. run, running they make it up to be, the, the, the better it is. Well, it gets but, me in the papers every couple of months. I'm not complaining. Uh, but well, I have to say. You, 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 um, we do not stand uh, by your uh, fellow spatter. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, our views on Aberdeen are fine. We did a special from Aberdeen. We were at, uh, I was at um, Granite Noir this year. And oh, had an yes. absolutely splendid time with uh, Hugh Fraser. And we did a special uh, from, the, from the festival. And my goodness me, they looked at, uh, after us very well at the Lemon Tree. And uh, it gives me another opportunity to actually just say, what a wonderful meal Hugh and I had at the Bonobo Vegan Restaurant. <laughs> and... At the wonderful Najil Turkish restaurant, two of the finest meals I've had all year. So thanks once again uh, for for that delicious food and the wonderful warm welcome we had in Aberdeen. Wish we'd met you. You weren't there this year, were you? Were you there this year? I didn't see you. I I was festival ambassador, um, which meant I did a lot of stuff before the festival. And then I had my deadline over the weekend and had to be chained to my computer. That's right. Your so photograph was in the programme and I never saw you. That's right. I, I missed all the good... I missed, basically, I missed all the good bits. Oh. <laughs> did, did all the hard work was, and then missed it. Well, not all the hard work. The, the, the Lee, Lee Randall may do a little bit of the hard work. Yeah. She's, uh, she's wonderful, isn't she? My goodness I, you me. Know, she, she does the, you know, the programming and the organising and the actual setting stuff up and the running of things. But, you know, I, 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 I'm very pretty. So, so that's but, what exactly. You're the poster boy. But, but Aberdeen, um, aside from being um, home to these wonderful restaurants and also my favourite airport in the world, is also home to you, Stuart, and is where you set your uh, Logan McRae books. We, we talk a lot on this podcast about setting and and how that kind of influences people. I mean, apart from being home, what about Aberdeen appeal to you in terms of setting for your crime novels? That was really it. That was the <laughs> primary driver. Um, I'm, I'm going to name drop here because, you know, I'm fabulous. Um, but I, I used to work for a Sharni Wee internet company, um, and they were looking to, to produce their own content for, for, for the website. And I reviewed one of Ian Rankin's new books. Yeah, and I've never down, heard of him. 
<laughs> and we bought him a, I bought him a pint and we chatted before his event. And during that, you know, I, I was thinking of writing a, I was writing a crime novel, my very first one. And he, I can't remember how it came up, but he said, well, you know, why not write it about Aberdeen? Because at that point, everybody was writing about either Edinburgh or Glasgow. That was it. Crime fiction just existed in that little band, um, except for Hamish Macbeth. And that was it. And I thought, well, okay. I mean, for, for one thing, it cuts down my research hugely. <laughs> It is just on the doorstep. I grew up there. Um, these are my people. And hopefully if I write about it, people will buy it because it's set where they know. Mm. And it seems to have worked wonderfully well as well. You've got, I mean, how many books down are we now? I mean, the the new one, The Blood Road, is number 11. So um, well into the series now. I think we're about 16 books in total. Okay. So you, there were short story collections and things as well in the middle, weren't there? And novellas and, and what and have you. Sta- and standalones and oh, doodads right. and whatnots. And... Got you. Oh, well, The Blood Road is the most recent one. That's out in June. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, the Blood Road basically kicks off when D.I. Bell turns up dead in a crashed car, which is a, a terrible shock for his colleagues because they buried him two years ago. <laughs> so the whole thing starts to, um, it, it's where has he been for the last two years? Who did they really bury? And what was so important that it brought him back from the dead? <sighs> and it all sort of goes down the hill from there in terms of, uh, <laughs> of niceness. That's not a way to sell a book, Stuart. It all goes downhill from there. <laughs> well, you know, it's not what you would call... Uh, there are certainly moments of humour in it, but it's it, it does deal with some quite um, some quite dark and uh, serious themes. Hmm. That, well, I mean, that as, as a concept is, is just extraordinary. In fact, these, you know, this... We, we like our, our high concepts, don't we? On this, on this show, we, we, we are. About We're very got, high got concepts and um, uh, and, and as, a, as a hook, that's amazing. Like, that is, yeah. like, I love that. And it's not even on. It's not even on the front cover. Actually, it should be really to, yeah, yeah. to some degree. But what would you say uh, about uh, Logan McRae? What is different about Logan McRae? Do you think from from other uh, detectives? Uh, on well, the, yeah, no. But, well, when I when I started writing. All my life I have loved crime fiction, ever since I was a wee boy and I started in the Hardy Boys and then moved on to Dashiell Hammett and all the way through um, more modern crime rather than uh, the Golden Age stuff. But there was always a pattern. The central detective is always larger than life. Oh, blimey. Sound and so are too. you. That's... Uh, uh... <laughs> Uh-huh. No, You're that's right, Stuart. That's, that's, f- that's my phone telling me I'm meant to be doing a podcast. Oh, right. Well, <laughs> I- I- ignore it and talk to us instead. S- someone called Adam and Bob? I've never heard of them. I'm just going to dismiss that. No. I don't think we need that. Stalkers. Stalkers. Get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> you were saying? Right. Yes, he said, turning off his phone. <laughs> Professionally. <laughs> it's a lovely sound, by the way. Well done. It's, it's right. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, where the hell was I? Oh, yes. So... So I, Larger than life. Uh, yeah. So the central character of all these detective novels is always larger than life. Basically, they are a weirdo. Uh, you take Rebus, you have, you know, he's very much into his rock music and his, well, basically every kind of music, and it's borderline alcoholic um, and incredibly thrown. And you've got Morse with his real ale and his classic cars and his opera, and you have Sherlock Holmes with his violin and his implacable logic and his opium. And you have, I mean, everybody, Faro is weird, Miss Marvel is weird. Every single central character of detective fiction is a freak, you know. But they always have a normal person that they drag around with them so that the author can explain the plot to the reader. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun to write a book where the central character is Watson or Siobhan or Lewis so that Logan is a normal everyday bloke, he is you and me, and it's the people that he works for, D.I. Steele and D.I. Inch and all the rest of them, they should be the hero of the crime novel because they are weirdos. So it's just a, it's just a really simple inversion 
um, of that standard mechanism for how crime fiction is meant to work. And I like that because we were speaking to um, David Mark a few weeks ago, and he he had a sort of a, a similar idea. He was saying about this fact that you know all of the detectives are these kind of you know hard drinking alcoholics. They've, they've got all their issues, and you know their issues are very kind of out there and dark and all the rest of it. And his main detective, um, Hector McAvoy, I think he he says you have to pronounce it with a um, like Hector, <laughs> but with a cough in the middle. Um, he's he's a very he's very much kind of a gentle giant, isn't he? Yes. He's, um, you know, he's, he's very, he's, he's, he's a massive guy, but he's um, he's shy and retiring, all the rest of it. And that's, uh, I, I like when authors do that. Like you say, they they take the tropes and they kind of turn them on their head. Um, do you kind of credit that to a lot of the success of the Logan McRae books, or do, you know, is it just because you're, you know, the best writer in the world, Stuart? <laughs> oh, I couldn't possibly comment on that, obviously. <laughs> um, no, I, I think it's. Uh, I think people have liked the fact that he is a normal person, so he is a bit different from the norm. But you still get the that vicarious "here's a weirdo" hit from the people that he works for. And also, I, I, th- I mean, when I started writing crime fiction, it was very rare to come across any detective with a sense of humour at all. Um, there was very, very much a case of, if it is serious, then it must be serious. It is murder. What can be more serious than that? And they, they, they basically, that was all they did. They just went out after the killer. And there were very, very few novelists who were actually allowing the characters, the humanity, to have a sense of humour. You know, which is which is weird because one of one of the defining characteristics that we have as a species is that we always in groups try to make each other laugh. You know, that, that's it's. Do you want to get Do you want to get really sort of in depth and dull about this? Uh, okay, in depth. Okay. You, apparently, I don't think you it, could be dull if you tried, Stuart. Oh, I can try. I can definitely try. <laughs> um, apparently, apparently, back back when we used to live in the trees, and we used to pick nits and things off of each other. That was only last that, Thursday for Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Hence all the hair. Exactly. <laughs> and basically, you could groom a social... You could get yourself a social group of around 15 to 20 individuals, and that was about as much because it would take too long to go around. And when we learned to laugh and to, to make other people laugh, it's suddenly much easier to groom a larger group of people and not in an Operation U tree way. But you, you, could, you are basically psychically picking the nits off of a larger number of people all at the same time until you get up to Dunbar's number, which is 150 individuals is the the maximum that one individual is meant to be able to support as a a friendly network, which was the size of a small village. And that's how we've evolved. So when we're in teams, that's what we do. I have never worked in a team of people where they do not spend as much time as possible taking the piss out of each other in order to make each other laugh. But in crime fiction, it just almost never happened. Everybody were these serious robots for justice. So I just made police officers like real people. And that's why the books are entertaining. And I guess that's why they've built such a, um, such a, a an audience which is, is dedicated to the books as they are. Because you have got a very kind of tight um, fan base and a, a good strong core of people that have been there right from the start. Very sexy, intelligent people. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Keep keep um, keep giving them the compliments. Steel. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, the new book, The Blood Road, um, is out now in uh, in hardcover and ebook. I think the paperback comes out um, early next year, doesn't it? It does. Yes. Excellent. Um, well, it's. Um, I, I, one thing I wanted to, to ask you, ah, yes, listening yes, to your yes. wonderful, delightfully fruity, dulcet tones uh, over the over the waves. Can you call them waves anymore? I don't think you can. <laughs> over the digital watsits. Um, I, I noticed that you were a professional actor. Uh, um, for, a, for a very small period of time. For a very small period, for a very small p- period of time. Did you enjoy the experience? Um, I enjoyed certain aspects of the experience. Yeah. And he, he, he said, standing up so that he may project properly across yeah. the intertubes. <laughs> um, I th- oh, it's very difficult to make a living acting yes. in Aberdeen because there's you know, once you've done voiceovers for you know, the fixed down wheel, Patrol William has to be set into the off position. You can do so like this. There's only so many of those videos you can do. Yes. Um, and then emergency response role play. And... It, it has cured me. I will never, 
ever be a transvestite because of appearing in panto. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I have I have genuinely made money dressed as a woman. Uh, I mean, it's a, I mean, I've I've done dame once or twice, um, and I have leanings in that direction in a professional capacity. Um, and uh, I would say it's quite interesting that um, uh, you know you went to Harriet Watt. I can remember in 1982 being part of the Royal Lyceum Company there for about three years, and uh, playing Harriet Watt because the National Theatre came and chucked us out of the Lyceum to do a big Tom Stoppard play. So we had to make a the Lyceum Company had to make a theatre across at Harriet Watt. Um, we had a great time as it happened. Um, uh, no cross-dressing, uh, not in that particular play. I, I enjoyed it. But uh, are you a panto lover? Would you say you like? A, has it put you off panto for life? Well, it's been a while since I've I've been in one, um, and we do live in the middle of nowhere. But no, there's there's something quite endearing about just the sheer British absurdity yeah. of pantomime. Yes, well, it is quite absurd, isn't it? I, I've avoided it for many years, and I don't think I can see myself going going back to it. But do you talking about the the, the theatre? Obviously, you had a, a love of theatre, which was uh, an acting uh, at one point. Would you ever think of taking your books in in that direction? We've asked this question of several uh, uh, writers. I mean, Peter James, I've done one of his plays uh, myself, and uh, Ian Rankin as <coughs> Rebus is is about to be adapted for the stage at, at Birmingham. We mentioned last week. Would you? Could you see? Uh, uh, Luca McRae treading the boards? Well, we've had a few production companies interested and they've taken out options, but every single time the option has expired, I've gone, I'm never doing this again. Yeah. This is just a terrible experience. I think because um, because of the way that I've structured the books, that Logan is a normal person and he works for weirdos, that for television people is just doesn't make sense. <coughs> no. So every single treatment Logan gets has to be really weird and they have to give him strange traits that he doesn't have. Oh. And then all the other, you know, D.I. Steel has to be toned down so she doesn't overpower him on screen. And it's just, well, what was the point of doing this book then? You've just, you have just urinated away everything that was actually unique about it. You've changed all the characters. You've changed the killer is. Why? So I, <laughs> Why I don't to write have... a fresh book. That would have been easy. Well, it was that, that Peter James yeah. story where he, he he suddenly got sent a script from a company he didn't even realise had optioned the Roy Grace, uh, and he found that it was it was actually this is uh, true. I'm sorry, it was set in Aberdeen, mm. and Roy Grace well, was not Roy Grace. Detective. It was a female detective. Roy Grace wasn't Roy anymore. Uh, we're, we're back to um, uh, 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 pantomime. Yeah, back to pantomime. <laughs> it was uh, I don't know what her name is. Harriet Grace or whatever. And he, of course, he went. This is ridiculous. How dare you? So yes, I know what you mean. But would you actually? Could you see Logan McRae on stage? Uh, I could. Do you know what I would like? Yeah. Flesh House the musical. Ah, <laughs> now you're talking. No, that was that was my big cannibal serial killer novel. Oh. My, my my homage to to basically horror novels as well. Ab mm. uh, Aberdeen, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> um, Not quite. It's, well, the, the, the strap line would be, cannibalism is a team sport and everyone gets to play. <laughs> Cannibal, Reaper you'll go on my first whistle. Sausages now. <laughs> well, aside from the writing and the acting, Stuart, um, a little birdie tells me you're not so bad at close-up magic either. <sighs> yes. Who told you that? Oh, I couldn't, uh, couldn't possibly tell you. We may be hundreds of miles away, but uh, news, news of that talent travels very fast. Did you know, I, was, I, was, I was hoping this wouldn't get out. Well, So, so you're going to do a trick uh, for us, and we, 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 we await with bated breath. All right, but you, you pushed me into this. Yes, okay. we, we, we did, and we apologise for not warning you in right. advance. Right. Let, 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 let me get the cards. OK. Oh, this is real, real life now, magic. Okay, I want you to pick a card, any card. Any one. Don't let me see it. Okay. Don't let me see it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that one, yeah. Yeah. You, okay. Show it to Bob. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. got it. Got Bob, it. Adam, you're both quite right. Now put it back in the back in the pack, anywhere, anywhere at all in the pack, you put that back. Don't let me see it. Okay, yeah, yep. put it back there, yeah. Okay, let's give that a good shuffle. Right, Okay. Think of your card. Yep. Mm -hmm. You picturing it clear in your head? Yes. Okay. Right. I'm going to try that this. I haven't done this before live on on the web. So ready? One, two, three. 
Is that your card? Wow. That's ah. absolutely extraordinary. That's astonishing. Uh, we must... I, I, I can't tell you how I did it, obviously, magic circle rules. Well, and of course the, the listeners can't can't see it, so they're just going to have to um, trust us. Aren't Take they? our, our was, word for it. I mean, that was extraordinary. Wow. That was one of the most. I mean, it's not close magic; it's far away magic because you're about five hundred, six hundred miles away from us. Which but which makes it even more difficult. It it does. Mm. Your magic even powers are, have have no restrictions whatsoever. They're just universal. Um, well, that's extraordinary. Um, and now, if you look in your left trouser pocket, yes, you'll find Adam's pants. Uh, Goodness uh-huh. gracious me! I wonder where they've gone. I, goodness gracious me! That's a strange colour. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I think that'll be a great ending. Yes, I think, I we'll, think, leave strange, I think we'll leave it a strange colour. <laughs> Thank you. Listen, it's been del- absolutely delightful talking to you. Thank you for introducing us to the world of Logan McRae. And uh, I know that our listeners uh, worldwide will now be going on to Kobo and downloading. Start with the first. Oh, uh, you don't have to, I, I, I dare say, but uh, uh, Cold Granite uh, is, the, is the first in, in the series. So I always think it's a good idea to start at the beginning and, and work your way through. But uh, it's been smashing talking to you. And I say, if you weren't a, a hugely successful uh, crime writer, I think you make a, a a very fine stand-up comic. Stuart's books are, of course, available on Kobo. Where else would you want to buy them? Um, if you're a new Kobo customer, then you can get 90% off of your first book at Kobo by going to kobo.com and enter the promo code CRIME at the checkout, and they'll give you 90% off. An extraordinarily kind offer only for listeners to Partners in Crime. And while we're talking about Kobo, we need to mention as well this week, it's been announced that they're uh, partnering with Walmart in the US. No. I'm going to pretend I knew all about this corporate deal. <laughs> so yeah, when you um I, I don't know the details of it, but essentially um you can buy ebooks through Walmart in the US, which is basically the the only massive massive supermarket brand there. Um and uh, they'll all be supplied through Kobo. So if your books as a writer are on Kobo, um you will now be available in Walmart, which is great. That's amazing. Can it, are Kobo present in, in British supermarkets? Does Walmart own any British supermarkets? They own Asda, I think. Ah, so... Or there's the, something to the, do the, with maybe, it. Well, um, who knows? Mm. Maybe maybe they'll be available in, 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 in Kobo, uh, yeah. in uh, Asda. Well, yeah, quite possibly at some point, yeah. Yeah, that would be yeah, good. So that's, um, that, cool. that's, that's a massive boost for, for any US listeners as well. You can um, get 90% off of your purchase by uh, entering the promo code CRIME at the checkout. And you can then, if you like it, you can buy future ebooks. At your local Walmart. Plus is, three uh, cents are for your cheese slices. <laughs> Have you been doing voiceovers for Walmart again? Uh, <laughs> I, I wish. I thought I recognised it from from the Blind Dogs Blind Dogs Trust, the Guide Dogs Trust. You are very on, kind. Our American listeners on. are going. That's an American accent. Who's he kidding? <laughs> is that, is that um, what it was meant to be? <laughs> but uh, yes, well, uh, an, another lovely inter- interview. Um, I have to say, and hugely entertaining, as all our guests seem to be, happily. Um, I should probably point out as well that Stuart's um, Stovey's recipe is available on his website. He wanted yes. us to um, to let you all know. Yes. If you do want to make his um, his Stovey's, or a Stovey, can you have a Stovey? Is it uh, a, I don't say you can have a singular Stovey. Uh, have you ever had a singular Stovey? I don't think I've had a Stovey's of any sort. I'm not entirely sure what stovies are. I've had I've had stovies in the plural on on many occasions, but I didn't realise they were so contentious and and each recipe was so um, loyally guarded by its originator. Um, so yes, I, we're going to get um, that particular recipe, and uh, well, I'll hopefully have it long long before I'm next in in Aberdeen. Mm. So this week. Uh, well, actually, let's talk about next week first because we've got a, a superb guest on next week, which we, we should not go without mention at the end. Another of Scottish episode. writer, you say? Yes, uh, somebody by the name of um, Val McDermott. I've, I'm, I don't know. I've never never heard the of great, her. the legendary. <laughs> yes, yeah, she'll be joining us on the show next week to talk about her brand new book, um, which has just been released. So that's uh, that's going to be fantastic. Um, if you have any questions you want us to ask her, then do send them in. Hello at partnersincrime dot online, or tweet them to us at Crime Fic Podcast. Your questions for Val. Um, but back to this week. Um, rather than going and getting a coffee, should we go and make some stovies? Uh, yes. Can you stick them in the percolator? I'll I'll try. I'm going to watch. Partners in Crime was presented by Adam Croft and Robert Dawes and produced by Adam Croft.
The theme tune was by the Caesareans. The Partners in Crime logo and imagery were designed by Stuart Beish. Partners in Crime is sponsored by Kobo, your favourite local bookshop, perfected.